Go. Hi, I'm Gail Backfish, or you may remember me as Gail Cloninger. My feelings of community or belonging to a group started when I was a mother of two little girls and as a new member of Community Presbyterian Church. I started the chair of choir in 1984 for two to five year olds when my daughters were two and four and they are 37 and 40 now. The choir met every Thursday afternoon from four to five and we prayed together, ate snack together, sang together, danced together, played instruments and gave our pennies for two cents a meal. And we also played on the playground together. The choir performed once a month at 11 o'clock service. During the 18 years I directed the choir, I met families from the church, the preschool, and the neighborhood. And many children and their families became members of Community Presbyterian Church. In fact, many of those children are now adults with families of their own, and they're members of CPC. It has been a joy for me to watch those children grow into Christian adults who are now having raising their own children. Just like the chair of choir, we need to continue to pray together, fellowship together with meals, sing, dance, and play instruments, and give our money to worthy causes. A community is a place where you want to be as often as you can, a joyful place, a happy place. Community Presbyterian Church is that place. everyone. My name is Melissa Daniel and I'm the Director of Education, Christian Education at Community Presbyterian Church. I wish we could go down to the river to pray like Shauna <laughs> invited us to, one of my very favorite songs, yes. 
But in any event, I'm very glad that you could be with us here this morning. We ask that you join us after the Lord's Prayer and listen for an update from our session. And now let us worship the Lord. God has forgiven us and draws us close. God is reconciling us through Jesus Christ, who, who has lavished upon us the fullness of the Holy Spirit. With glad and grateful hearts, we praise the Lord. And now a prayer for summer's ending based on work by Arian Braithwaite Lynn. Let us pray. O oh God, thank you for all the ways you have walked with us this summer. You have made your presence known through tracked in sand on the kitchen floor and the smell of fresh strawberries dumped on the counter. We have heard your voice in the joyful shrieks of children and the long, lazy evenings spent in conversation. You have held us through the weeks that were stressful and weeks that evaporated in joy, weeks when we were complacent and selfish and weeks when we were sacrificial and servant-hearted, weeks when we were honest and filled with integrity and weeks we didn't even recognize the person in the mirror. You never failed to remind us how you love us and still had good for us to do. How we thank you, O oh God, for traveling with us during these summer months, for offering reassurance as we enter the fall and all its change. We hold out our gratitude for what was and our quiet hopes for what is to come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. As we confess our sins without fear, to the one who yearns to embrace us, protect us, forgive us, and bless us. Let us go to God in prayer. Have mercy on us, Lord, Lord Jesus. Our lives have been disrupted by our own desires and our selfish exploits. We are dismayed by the fallout of our own failures. We cannot take back what we have said or undo what we have done or atone for the agony we have caused. We are haunted by the past, plagued by the present, and fearful of the future. We shrink away as strangers outside your circle need a blessing. Yet the faith you have planted in us reaches out for your favor, return to your presence, and hungers for your mercy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our God touches our hearts, forgiving our sins, preserving our lives, and restoring our souls through the abundant provision of our Lord Jesus Christ. Receive now that for which faith has hungered. You are forgiven and healed in the name of Jesus Christ, giving us the peace that passes all understanding. And now as God's given, free, and forgiven people, we invite you to send a sign of Christ's peace by leaving a comment, sending a text or email to a neighbor, a smile, or wave to those that are worshiping around you. Peace be with you, and also, and also with, with you. you. friends, it's time for our special time for our youngest disciples. And I just want to talk to you a little bit about as we get ready to go to school, or some of us have already had our first week of school, I'm sure there's a lot of nervous tummies out there and a lot of people that are ready with a lot of excitement. School is usually so much fun because we get to see our friends and we get to learn lots of new things. But as we return to school, I want to make sure that besides all the reading, the writing, and the arithmetic that you're learning, we're also learning how to be God's people. I want to share a poem with you 
that will help you to remember this. And it's called, All I Really Need to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten. And it was written by a gentleman named Robert Fulgham, who is even older than me when he wrote this poem. Most of what I really need to know about how to live and what to do and how to be, I learned in kindergarten. Wisdom was not at the top of the graduate school mountain, but there in the sand pile at Sunday school. These are the things that I learned. Share everything. Play fair. Don't hit people. Put things back where you found them. I'm going to repeat that one again for my children out there. Put things back where you found them. Clean up your own mess. Don't take things that are not yours. Say you are sorry when you hurt someone. Wash your hands before you eat, and in these times, wash your hands after you eat, and once you go into a room, and once you leave a room, and any other time that you can wash your hands. Flush. Warm cookies and cold milk are good for you. Live a balanced life. Learn some and think some and draw and paint and sing and dance and play and work some every single day. Take a nap every afternoon. When you go out into the world, watch out for traffic. Hold hands and always stick together. Always be full and aware of wonder. If we always try to be God's people and know that God is always with us, we can make our schools and our world a kinder place. And now we're going to close this special time in a prayer that our friends who attend our preschool say every day. Please join in this prayer with me by repeating after me. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus, Please show us how to spend this day. Please show us how to spend this day. Sharing your love in every way. Sharing your love in every way. Help us to be kind to everyone. Help us to be kind to everyone. To play and laugh and have lots of fun. To play and laugh and have lots of fun. Shining your light and giving your grace. Shining your light and giving your grace. Sharing your joy with a smile on our face. Sharing your joy with a smile on our face. Amen. Amen. Good morning, everyone. As we prepare our hearts to, uh, and we prepare our hearts and minds and ourselves to give God of our tithes, our gifts, our offerings, um, I wanted to kind of... Uh, Kind of promote Mission House for a moment here in our Thursday night group that does it once a month where we feed, um, the, feed, the, feed the folks there at Mission House. Kim McCormick is um, in charge of this. I had the opportunity this past week to help out a little bit. And um, I kind of tell you a neat story. Last month when we did it, we, they were still, in, Mission House was still kind of giving out dinners for the guys, for people to take with them, primarily sandwiches. And, um, we didn't know that, and so our group went in there and we made spaghetti, garlic bread, salad, and boiled eggs. And the, um, we served them up in, in to-go trays, and the people were just, our guests were just ecstatic. And they were like, spaghetti, we haven't had this like in a really long time. So Mission House gave us permission to go in there and to cook once a month and, and prepare the spaghetti meal that they all look forward to. Challenge is, now that Mission House is back open, they are a safe place. They have glass up. They ask you to wear your gloves, wear your mask. The guests wear masks as well. So it's a very safe place to, to, um, to reach out and to work. Um, they need your help, and Kim could use a few more volunteers. So if you'll go to our website or our app or whatever, you should see a way to sign up there if you would. Kim says, go on down the page to where you see Sign Up Genius 2020. And put your name on there, and she would appreciate it. If you can't find all that, shoot me an email or a phone call, and I'll walk you through it. Let's go to God. We appreciate all the ways that you give and support the church, the staff, the missions, and everything else that we do here. We, from the bottom of our hearts, we give you thanks. Let's, give, let's go to God in prayer. Holy God, you know that whatever we have compared to your abundance is relatively small. 
But the good thing, God, is you invite us to share in your work. So we bring what we have, ourselves, our gifts, our talents, our money, all the blessings that you give us. We bring those and we lay them at your feet. And we know that you can take those and in your way, you can multiply them to reach out to folks and to share your love, your grace with everyone around us. And it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Our first scripture reading this morning comes from Romans chapter 1, verses 8 through 12. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you, because your faith is proclaimed throughout the world. For God, whom I serve with my spirit by announcing the gospel of his Son, is my witness that without ceasing I remember you always in my prayers, asking that by God's will I may somehow at last succeed in coming to you. For I am longing to see you so that I may share with you some spiritual gifts to strengthen you, or rather, so that we may mutually encur be encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. As we continue with our sermon series, Focusing on our church's mission statement, we look, this, we look today at worship. Last week was community and growing in community. This week is worship. So our, our second scripture reading comes from the book of John, John chapter 15. And Jesus is speaking and he says this, This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this, to lay down one's life for one's friend. You are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer, because a servant doesn't know what the master is doing. But I have called you friends, because I have made known to you everything that I have heard from my father. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and I appointed you to go and bear fruit. Fruit that will last, so that the Father will give you whatever you ask him in my name. I am giving you these commands so that you may love one another. I no longer call you servants, but I call you friends. The scripture in John shows us there's a transition that happened that day and in the lives of the disciples. They were being called, they are being transitioned from being a follower of Christ to a friend of Christ. In seminary, I was given um, the assignment to write a paper answering the question, where does Sunday morning worship begin? My answer was that worship begins in the parking lot. Worship begins when a person begins to walk up to the sanctuary from the parking lot and is greeted, welcoming them to church. 
A person may hear their name called if they're a member of the church. And then maybe a good morning, good to see you. If they're a visitor, hopefully they hear a good, a good morning, a welcome. Is this your first time here? Here's the sanctuary. And they're walked over and then they're greeted by an usher. A, tra a transition begins to happen. The stage is beginning to sit, be set. A person begins to feel at home. They get, they get a sense of belonging. They get one pulls into the parking lot, you gotta think about this, with a lot of stuff in their life. It could be a good day already, or it could be a bad day. As I was writing this, I recall my mother sang in the church choir, and I would hear her on Sunday mornings back there getting her voice all ready, and then she got dressed and everything else, and she was in a, a, a praise uh, frame of mind, and then she would have to load up five kids in a 1963 Country Squire station wagon and drive to church. And there were times when we'd pull in that parking lot and we had robbed her sense of praise because we were just all over the place, you know. Or she would have to spend time getting us all complete to go from the, from the parking lot into the church. Transition has begun. A lot of stuff going on in people's lives. Again, it could have been a great day or it could have been the start of a bad day. Maybe they've had a rough week at home, at work, dealing with family stuff, medical stuff. The list could just go on and on and on. And they pulled into the parking lot and they brought it with them. And now what happens from the parking lot to the sanctuary is important. A transition begins. That's why when I hear, and it was so used to bless me, when Gabe would say, the most important job in the church is the greeters and the ushers. I used to totally agree with him. You are the ones who prepare our hearts. You are the ones that get us ready for worship. I thought about this and I said, this would be, that question would be a kind of a hard a question to answer this day and time as we gather around our computers in our homes and you're sitting there. There's that time being missed walking in. A few weeks ago, my uh, family and my grandchildren were listening to me on the, my daughter-in-law's phone. They said, she said, listen to Abba, he's at church, he's preaching. And they all went, church? There's donuts? Donuts? That's how they connect with church. So this day and time, I feel like it may have been just a little bit more difficult to answer that question. However, you're sitting there, you log on, and this morning you heard a testimony, and then you hear the playing of familiar music. That music begins to set the tone and the image of being in the sanctuary or the fellowship hall. You begin to connect and the images begin to come to your mind what it was like when we were all together or what it's like to worship. The reality is that worship has begun when you sit there on that computer and you hear the music and those images begin to flash in your mind. So you, the unique thing about worship is it brings us all together, it brings people together. Gathering for corporate worship engages and connects with people's minds, our hearts, and our spirits. We are reminded of our identity in Christ. For a short time, all that parking lot stuff is not what identifies us. You're in a different place. And suddenly you're reminded of your, your identity in Christ and who you are as a child of God. The scripture lesson today may be divided really into two major sections. The first focusing on the abiding relationship of a love that, bound, that binds the father and the son and bound them all together and the disciples all into one. And then the second part it may be focusing on the empowering love of the son by which he laid down his life for his friends. Jesus' disciples are no longer servants, but friends. Not on the basis of what they have done, but on the basis of what he did for them. He has made known to them everything he says that he heard from the Father. So there is a transition now that's beginning to happen in their lives and with their relationship with Jesus. As we engage in worship, we too learn and we experience what Jesus has done and we shift into a deeper friendship with Christ. You see, a servant was 
and what Jesus refers to here, a, a servant was and is was just a tool, a device, a means to accomplish something without having to in, explain or engage. And now the call to be something more has been issued. When you looked at the word servant, there were two different kinds of ideas that were really kind of presented about servanthood. But neither one of those positions about servanthood or of servanthood are committed to a relationship out of a love or a kindred spirit. Here in this scripture, we see where Jesus has given the definition and a model of what friendship is. He's showing us that everything he touches, he deepens and he glorifies. You see, real friendship between two people, Jesus infers here, involves a certain bond to each other, a kinship of spirit more radical than the differences that may, may be between those two people or their relationship. You've got to remember in that room, Jesus was dealing with a lot of different people from a lot of different backgrounds. And also he is here, he's also spe speaking to Judas who would betray him a little bit later on. Matthew records that when Judas comes up to betray him in the Garden of Gethsemane, that Jesus said, friend, you come to me, he called him friend again. It's that relationship that Jesus calls him to. So there's, Jesus infers that there's a certain bond that happens, a, a kinship of spirit that is more radical than all the differences there and the differences that may be in our lives as well. This is essential or there cannot be a relationship or a friendship at all. Jesus also says that one must be willing to give oneself for the other. What is understood here is that one must be willing to give itself to another person as well. He's calling for mere obedience. It's less than what he's asked for. That was what the servant's part was all about. When you think about friendship, I was asked a few years back um, to take a young man, and he had gotten in trouble at school, in high school, and I had to take him over to Maddie B. Rutherford. And this was a transitional program that would help students get back on track. A rough school. A rough program. But it was there to help them get back on track so they could assimilate themselves back into their high school as soon as possible. So we had to go into the meeting with the principal for his orientation. Um, his parents, I was asked to do this and he asked me to do it. And pretty much his parents had given up on him. And so he said, you know, I really want to graduate. I really want to stay in school. Would you help me do this? So I took him over there a few times. But on the first day, we had to go in and we had to meet with the principal and we had to go through orientation. And during our discussion with the principal, she gave a definition of a friend that I thought that was really great. And I tried to write it down as I could quote it, and I probably can't, but uh, she said that a friend is someone who will help you become the best that you can become. They'll call you, they'll keep you out of trouble, they'll call you out, they'll motivate you to help you to accomplish what you need to accomplish in order to be the kind of person, the best kind of person that you can be. What a friend, if you think about it, what a friend we have in Jesus. Jesus helps us to become the kind of friend and the kind of people that we need to become. What a friend we have. We just need to learn to listen to him a little bit more. I know for me I do. Here in John, you see that love and mutual knowledge go hand in hand. You see, it's this kinship, this friendship, this relationship that not only binds us together with Christ, but also to each other. I've called you friends. We're all connected. We are bound together. It goes beyond our differences and all that stuff that we deal with, that we identify with, and says we are bound together by God's love and by what God has done for us through his son, Jesus Christ. When we gather for worship and when we serve others expressing our love for God and for God's people, which is another way of worship, we express our admiration to God and in the sacrificial love of Jesus Christ that he gave to us. When we focus on that love, that 
thing that binds us all together, then all the trivial things and the things that separate us fall to the side and pass away. Our whole lives is a search for wholeness. Our very existence as individuals and as a community of faith should be to be living with the conviction that worship is in everything that we do. We have been called friends with Christ, an intimate relationship that incorporates everyone and everything that we do as an offering to God. That's worship. And in this search for wholeness, we strive to encounter God who is fully present with us at all times. Whether we're, doing, whether we're in our neighborhoods, or we're doing our mission work, or we're doing our daily tasks, or when we gather for praise and prayer. We are to structure our lives in, in obedience to the vision that God has given us of what wholeness is like through the life and death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that's what the bond of friendship is all about, that kinship. Dietrich Bonhoeffer said that a Christian is not a religious person but just simply a human being living in community. We are called to live as friends of God in Christ's community in all things. So how would I answer the question, where does worship begin in our current situation today? I think the best way I could answer it is, is when we get up in the morning and we begin to set ourselves and our hearts to be the kind of friend that God has called us to be. I need reminders from it on this from time to time just to what kind of wake up and remind myself this is the day that the Lord has made. Let me be rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. As we prepare our hearts to go to God in prayer I want to kind of give you an update and right after this, Lisa will be bringing a, um, our clerk of session will be bringing a, um, some news from our session. So, so follow-ups this week is Betty B is at home and continuing to recover, but it always appreciates any and all of our prayers. Duncan has been moved to rehab. If you'd like to send him a card, please let us know. We'll, we'll get you the address. Continue to pray for Joe and her family at the recent loss of her daughter. Let's go to God in prayer. Gracious and holy God, you are able to do abundantly above all that we may ask or think. Knowing your strengths, knowing what you bring into our relationship, as we count on our friendship, we stand before you and we ask in the name of Jesus that you be with those who have lost loved ones, especially the family of Chuck B. and Nancy B. We pray for those, O oh God, who have been affected recently by the COVID-19 virus, including George, Katie, and her oldest daughter. Help them to heal quickly and completely. We pray for those facing medical challenges, Butch, Rosa, Dennis W., Dennis, who is the brother of Lynn. Again, we lift up Winter and Duncan. Mike L., Kathy T., Caroline T., Margaret Ann, Shauna, Cindy A., Betty B., Uncle Damon. Oh God, wrap your loving arms around them, your healing arms around them. Be a source of healing and strength. We pray for those who are having surgery or recovering from surgery. Know the medical procedures like Ron and Andel. We pray for those facing cancer, Miss Sue, Diane E., Judy C., Jeremy, Dave, Carol, Rick, and Ricky. We offer heartfelt thanks and praise for prayers answered, including those for Terry, who, who is off the ventilator and continue to recover from the COVID-19, and Grant, who has had a wonderful recovery from his recent surgery. We pray for travel mercies, for Nancy and Jay. Gracious God, be, be with all those. And we pray for comfort for those who are struggling with anxiety during this time. We lift up you, Claudia. We pray for those in nursing homes and elsewhere who are experiencing isolation and loneliness. Let them know that they are loved, they are not alone. 
We pray for the students, the teachers, the staff, the bus drivers, and all those who are getting ready to start a school year, ease their anxiety. Let them know that they can get through this, be a source of strength for them. Gracious God, we lift up our church family. You've called us, you've empowered us, you lead us, you sustain us, you are with us. And our prayer is that you continue to guide us. Father, there are many that are on our hearts that we did not lift up this morning. So we take this opportunity to stand before you in silence and hold those that are dear to us up to you now. And now, holy God, I, lift, I lead your people in the prayer of the people. And that Jesus taught all people to pray together, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Good morning. My name's Lisa Harold, and I serve right now as your clerk of session, and I bring you a message from the session. Members and friends of Community Presbyterian Church, as many of you are already aware, our church building was entered after hours, and Pastor Melanie's office was severely vandalized on Monday night, July 28th. Additionally, a theft of less than $100 from Pastor Melanie's office occurred sometime between July 13th and July 15th. The police investigation is ongoing. Since that time, the church session has taken immediate steps to enhance and strengthen campus security to ensure the safety of our staff, members of our faith community, and all others who regularly use our campus. We will continue to monitor this situation and keep you advised as the investigation progresses. Last Wednesday, August 12th, the session received a letter from the Presbytery of St. Augustine, of which our church is a member, advising us of their awareness of the recent break-in and of their concern for Pastor Melanie and her family as a direct result of this break-in. They further instructed the session that we are to immediately grant Pastor Melanie of leave of absence until September 8th for her to seek counseling and heal from the trauma of the extreme vandalism inflicted on her office. While this is a requirement that was not sought by Pastor Melanie, she appreciates the Presbytery's concern and is following their instructions, as is the session. During Pastor Melanie's temporary absence, Reverend Bill Weimer and Ruling Elder Cindy Anderson have been appointed by the session to serve as co-heads of staff. Rest assured, the session and staff will continue to work together through these unprecedented times to share God's love to all members of our community. We do ask for your prayers for our staff and especially for Pastor Melanie and her family as we look forward to the days ahead when we can once again meet and be together, not only in spirit, but also in community. Thank you for your love and prayers as we move forward your session. And now receive this benediction. Assuming that you guys are all sitting around the house with loved ones, Paul to the Galatians says this, Greet one another with a holy kiss. All the saints send their greetings to you. Now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace. <laughs>